This is episode 21 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. And like last time, this episode is a little different. Most of the time, I speak to guests and hosts over the internet, eyes fixed on screens, talking to people from around the world. John Light is a recent transplant to Northern California. And after meeting at Bitcoin 2013, I asked him up to the LTB homestead, tucked into a canyon outside the Napa Valley, surrounded by steep redwood forests. Microphone in tow, we sat on the bank of the creek and talked about the future of identity in a networked world. Today's show is important. Granularity is a concept worth understanding. Imagine the seaside, waves crashing against the shore. As a whole, it's a singular object, a beach. It has its place, and it doesn't move. It's enormous and persistent. At a granular level, it's billions of tiny pieces of sand. Tidal impacts can move individual grains enormous distances, relatively speaking. When we talk about identity in this context, it's not about the beach. It's about the individual pieces of sand. Each one is a detail, attribute, event. They're you. Right now, you pick either the beach or no beach at all. But that's about to change. Privacy. You know, there was a time before Facebook and a time before social networks in general and a time before, frankly, websites where everything you put on them was owned by the website. I think that we might be moving back towards a time when suddenly this type of granular control over your own identity is possible. And it's because of concepts like personal clouds. I'm sitting here today with John Light, one of the good guys, so to speak, working on this, uh, this identity problem and this, this personal control problem. John, how did you get into personal clouds? When I started my blog, p2pconnects.us, which is a blog about peer-to-peer technology and how I think it can help solve a lot of the problems that are going on in the world today. The very first blog that I wrote, it was called Universal Reputation Rating Systems, The Future of Trust in a Networked Society. I wrote that based on technology that I saw coming out, which was essentially bringing all of people's social profiles together into one place to create what I'm calling right now a universal reputation rating. Basically, it pulls your eBay, your Airbnb, your Facebook, your Twitter, and it puts it all together and it creates a score for you know how likely you are to be trusted based on all of the connections that you have, all of your past history in the marketplace. I saw that as a trend. You know, the first company I I came across was called TrustCloud that did this. There's more. There's a a website called connect.me, which offers reputation rating system. It doesn't necessarily pull together all of your different social profiles like TrustCloud does, but it gives people a way to endorse you for different activities uh, to show that to other people, you know, yes, I, I'm vouched for in this way. And now LinkedIn has even incorporated something like that where people can endorse you for different skills. And so that's kind of how I got interested in, in reputation. And through researching for those blog posts that I wrote about that, the second one was called Universal Reputation Rating Systems Problems and Solutions, where I go into some of the pitfalls that uh, could be encountered with a, a reputation system like this, and then maybe some solutions for how that can be worked. Now, as I began researching for uh, writing these articles, I came across this concept called personal clouds, where the personal cloud is like your, your singular uh, place on the internet to put all of your identity information, all of your social information, financial information, everything that you would possibly need on the internet into one secure encrypted environment and then that identity that place marker on the web has its own reputation and what the connect.me service is trying to do is trying to serve as one of the primary reputation providers for the personal cloud ecosystem. No matter where you are on the internet, you're going to be able to carry around this reputation that you've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort building up rather than having to create a whole new reputation 
you know, every time you join a new community, like a, a new forum or a new marketplace or, you know, whatever. So, you know, right now we're starting to see the beginning of this with social sign on where you can actually use Facebook and other social networks to to log into places. Um, but but that's still not good enough. Uh, Facebook itself is a walled garden that you can't really export your data from it and take to other providers. Whereas with personal clouds, you're going to be able to do that. If you don't like your current personal cloud provider, you can just take all of that data that you spent, you know, so much time accumulating and organizing and just export it and drop it right into another cloud service provider, or you can post it yourself. When I came across this concept, I realized that it is going to do for the internet what Bitcoin is doing for money or what torrents are doing for file sharing. It is going to create a purely P2P, peer-to-peer environment where people are in full control of everything that's coming in and out. And that's, to me, I think really important, especially, you know, right now after the news has come out about Edward Snowden leaks, where we find out that these companies, which people have been entrusting with their data, aren't just sharing it with advertisers. It's going to governments for people everywhere else that's not in the USA, a government that's not even their own government. It's really important that people be given the tools to take control of their data and control of their privacy and personal clouds, I see, are a way to start doing that. Talking about social networks and services that keep data for you. You know, you're talking about how how they expose your data to other people in various places. So... Why is that? Why why is that the situation that we find ourselves in? What happened in the development of infrastructure up to this point? I mean, personal clouds are something that, you know, will be out in the next months or years. But this is a problem, clearly, that we've had for, for a while. So why is it, why did it take until now to start addressing it? The development of Diaspora, which was intended to be a, a decentralized and federated a social network, tried to start tackling this problem years ago. It's an open source project, so there's no real money or monetary incentive for people to to fully develop it. So, you know, while the developers have done a really good job of building a really great product, it's not perfect and it's not anywhere near as advanced in terms of security and granularity as personal clouds as a platform will be. You know, Diaspora could be looked at almost like a proto personal cloud, along with services like personal.com, where you can upload a bunch of your financial and medical and personal data, and it's all encrypted. But you can't really share it on such a granular level like personal clouds are going to be able to. So there's a lot of services that have tried to address this problem from different angles, but no one has yet really been able to bring it together to a holistic system, a holistic platform like personal clouds have. You know, how did we get here? Well, in terms of Facebook, they don't have any other revenue model other than to sell your data to advertisers. That's kind of Google's play as well. You know, that their revenue model is taking your data and then using it to serve you advertisements. It's a part of the, the revenue model. You know, they don't think that they can charge people to use their services. So instead, they give it to you for free. And then their customers are actually these ad companies. Um, You're not the customer, you're the product when you use social networks. Part of the challenge for personal clouds is going to be to find out whether people are willing to pay for privacy. I'm willing to pay for privacy, but is, you know, the average social network user, that remains to be seen. It's really just a matter of changing the incentives away from being incentivized to, to sell data or even just give it wholesale over to, you know, malicious governments and instead have an incentive to keep it private because the data owner is the customer, not the product. Does privacy matter in the modern age? I mean, I think if there's something that the recent revelations about state spying is concerned, you know, and basically all the stuff that's been coming out about how data is so insecure, it's really made me wonder, you know, I do a lot of business on Skype, for example, I do a lot of communication on Skype, and that's totally a compromised platform. And so I just kind of assume at this point that whatever I do, I better be comfortable with somebody out there, anybody out there being able to look at it because there just isn't much that can be done about it. I mean, do you think that this is something that even can be tackled reasonably or have we passed the point of no return? 
I think that's a really good question, especially as people, despite knowing what's going on with these social networks, continuing to use them. It's, it's an implicit acceptance of the status quo. I think it's dangerous, personally. Is privacy important? I think it's very important. I think people should be able to have an on and off switch for privacy instead of it just being you know, off all the time and then them having to jump over insane hurdles to get it to that on position. One of the most dangerous things about a lack of privacy on social networks is it's not just the individual pieces of information that go onto the social networks, it's the aggregation of this information. If you just put a few statuses on Facebook and maybe some location things on Foursquare and you text a few people on your cell phone, you know, individually those things might not seem so harmful, but you put it together and all of a sudden I know who you're hanging out with, where you are, where you're not, meaning that if you're not at home, your home is open to burglary or wiretapping or any other kind of malicious activity where people could then, you know, exploit these these openings in the various communications platforms that we have in order to commit serious crime against you. If you're a young, attractive individual and you suddenly develop a stalker who has a little bit of technological savvy, they might be able to find you when you're alone. I mean, that's a serious concern. It hasn't developed to be something where that's a common occurrence yet. I haven't personally heard of anyone using such an aggregation of information to do this stuff yet, but, but it's all out the there. threat is there, yeah. you know, and it's really not even just what this government is doing with our data. Who's the next guy that's going to be elected or gal? If Edward Snowden could have access to this information, who the hell is Edward Snowden? I have no idea. I didn't elect him. And yet he had access to all of this information. He said he could get dossiers on the president if he wanted to and read the president's text messages if he wanted to. That's really scary because all it would take is some criminal organization to infiltrate the NSA, literally just have one of their young members just go to college for InfoSec, go into the military, just through the whole step process and say, you're going to be our inside guy. They get behind the controls of this huge surveillance apparatus and rub their hands together and just start clicking away. And instead of leaking information to the Guardian, they leak information to their bosses. Well, but they've solved this. I, you, may, you might not have seen this, but they've got a solution to this leaking problem. You see, it's called the buddy solution. So anytime anybody needs to access confidential data in the same way that Mr. Snowden did, the process will be that there will be someone else who will have to sign off on it. And that will make it 100% secure, can never be compromised at all. And if that doesn't work, they're going to the three-man system. So it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, but I mean, you're totally right. We have, there, there are something like 500,000 people who have top secret security clearance, and that's ridiculous. You know, how can something be a secret when that many people know? It's really not just those individual situations. The systems themselves could become compromised to outside attacks where you don't even need an inside man. I mean, the government is pretty good at building an intranet where you need inside access in order to see some of this information. But it's only a matter of time before, you know, something like Stuxnet or flame or any of these really malicious viruses is able to find their way into these systems and just expose everything. Maybe it's not even just a concerted effort to take information and give it to a particular organization, but just to dump all of it. I mean, what happens when that happens? I mean, it's just, again, it's not the individual pieces of information that matter. It's the aggregation. It's being able to build a behavioral profile where I don't just know what you're doing right now. I can predict what you're doing for the next month because I know exactly what you do every morning. I know when you go to bed. I know who you hang out with. For some people, they have crazy lives and those things are harder to predict. But a lot of people are creatures of habit and these kinds of attacks become very easy. You know, it's just... That's what really concerns me, is that people are going to be exposing themselves in ways that they can't even imagine because they're only looking at it at one instance at a time. They're only experiencing it one instance at a time. They, they don't have this bird's eye view of what the whole picture looks like. And, and frankly, I think that if uh, governments can have this bird's eye view the people who they're collecting data on should be able to as well so that we can get this kind of full picture of, oh my God, I can tell 
what this is leading to now that I can see this whole profile on me. Facebook has already introduced social graphs, so you can kind of start to get a picture. I know this person and they know this person and this is what our whole thing looks like, but you add it in with cell phone data, you add it in with your Gmail accounts, you add it in with everything else that is being collected. It's a really scary picture. You use the word aggregation of data a couple of times, the term aggregation of data a couple of times, but I think that the way that I would say that is it's about the centralization of data because like you said, it turns it into a target. You know, I mean, it's just like Facebook is a huge target for being attacked because it houses so much personal data. If that's true, one has to imagine that systems that are designed to collect and combine data from all of these different enormous sites on the internet would of course, you know, communities on the internet would of course be an even larger target just because there's so much data there in the same way that web wallet services are bigger targets than individual Bitcoin wallets on computers. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it is the centralization really that is the, the key issue. You know, with personal clouds, you're still taking all of that data and aggregating it into one place, but it's your personal cloud, which which itself, you're going to be able to self-host it, you're going to be able to host it with third-party providers, okay, so we've talked you're going to be able to... We've kind of talked around personal clouds now, uh, but I think, it's, I think it's relevant to go back and talk about them in a kind of more basic way. I'm a user, I buy into what you're saying, and the privacy is an issue that I should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. So what does the system look like that's different? How, how is it different? How am I interacting with this personal cloud in a way that lets me do the things that you're saying I can use it to replace? That's a really good question. So I consider myself an enthusiastic end user. I'm not a programmer. Right. So I'm not working at the, on this Tell me the from vision. a technological Tell me the level, yeah, once it, once but, it works. but this is this is what it's going to look like, and this is why I'm so excited about it. So you're going to have a platform. Let's just, for an example, say that you're hosting it with a third party, which most people will do just like they host email with a third party. So this third party provider, when you first sign up in it with an account, you're going to get a user agreement, which should and will have... A framework it's called a, a, a trust framework which outlines exactly what and what not that company can do with your data not will do can do is that different than current when Facebook you know puts their terms of use out are they saying this is what we will or won't do but not talking about what they can't or are you just saying that that's important particularly in this case I think it's important particularly in this case all of the data will be encrypted by default there's only so much that the company will be able to do with it anyway. I can use an example of one of the existing trust frameworks. How I found out about this concept was through a company called the Respect Network, which is building a network of cloud service providers who all agree to what they call the Respect Trust Framework, which has five principles, including how the data is stored, you know, how the data is protected at the security level, interoperability, at the protocol level. So now when so you say interoperability, you mean the ability to... For all of these personal clouds to talk to each other. Okay. Regardless of who the service provider is. Okay. Redundancy, if their server goes down, your data is still safe somewhere else. And that is about how the data is actually handled. Several other points as well. I don't have them memorized. It's very basic, five principles, and then they elaborate from there to describe exactly how they're going to fulfill each of these principles. And that's going to be the basic contract that you're going to be getting into with these cloud service providers. The important part is that your data is encrypted by default. The kinds of uses that cloud service providers envision this platform being used for require it. They would be breaking multiple laws if they didn't. Things like HIPAA, the Health Insurance Something Privacy Act, laws that govern the privacy of data online so around what are the types financial of applications. Okay, institutions. so health, financial. Yeah, financial. Those are the two probably most sensitive and high risk kinds of applications with which these cloud service providers are expecting their users to trust them. Okay, with so that kind of data. So on the health side, what does mm -hmm. that look like? What's a scenario where a personal cloud is useful to me in a health capacity or a medical capacity? Sure. Let me just tell the story of oh, how sorry, the, sure. the personal cloud is going to work. So when you when you when you sign up for a personal cloud provider, they give you that agreement. You you 
you you kind of look at this and you say, do I agree to this? Yes, I agree to this. And then you start to fill out your basic information and upload some basic data about yourself, a name, a bio, your contact information, maybe attach some credit cards and debit cards and bank accounts. And from there, build relationships with other personal clouds. As you start to build relationships, each new relationship that you have, you'll be able to give them full granular access to the data that you have stored in your personal cloud. So what your family sees will be different from what your best friend sees, will be different from what your coworkers see, will be different from what your doctor sees, and so on and so forth. In the case of creating a relationship with your doctor, instead of your medical records going into a filing cabinet, which is you know stored behind his desk, they're just going to be dumped right into your personal cloud. And then as the doctor needs that data to do his job, you have a specific, what would be called a link contract, which governs when and for how long that data will be available to the doctor. So maybe his office is only open from nine to five. So the link contract says that he can only access your medical records from nine to five, Monday through Friday. And then the rest of the time, that connection is completely sealed off by the encryption. How this constant decryption and re-encryption of data occurs is currently being built into the, the personal cloud platform. That's one of the, the big challenges of building this kind of system is at the protocol level, building privacy in so that these features actually work. There's already a protocol called XDI, I believe, XDR, which will govern how the data is exchanged. In the instance of connecting with a friend, same deal. Basically, when you add them to your personal cloud network, you are going to give them specific permissions to access specific data. You know, you guys listen to the same music, so you'll let him access your music files that you've uploaded. You don't care if he knows your bio, so you, you give him permission to access your bio. He knows your real name, so you give him access to your real name. Now, let's flip this around and say it's not your best friend that you're adding to your personal cloud network. It's this new person. You, you just met them. Maybe instead of seeing your full name, they just see your first name. Instead of seeing your, your real picture, maybe they see a, 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 just some, some stock picture of you know, like a blank face or, or something like that. And they don't see your full bio. They just see your professional bio, something you don't mind being public. So, you know, things like that. As you gain trust with somebody, you can open them up to have access to more information. And then from there, it could be called a personal cloud because it's not just accessible from one centralized location. It's something that is going to be usable across devices so that my smartphone could access my personal cloud, my tablets, my computer. Any kind of technology platform that I have which has access to the internet will be able to access my personal cloud. I'll be able to authenticate to the personal cloud so that it lets me in and then I can control everything from there. I showed you a website where you could easily purchase electronics from the world's largest distributor with bitcoins at 0% markup? Would you think it was too good to be true? Good news, it's real and it's at bitcoinstore.com. Choose from half a million items, save money over Amazon and Newegg, and convert your bitcoins to real world items. You can even buy with privacy. All they need is a shipping address. But don't take my word for it. See for yourself at bitcoinstore.com. Let's Talk Bitcoin is an experiment focused on getting new ideas into the conversation. If you like what we're doing, visit letstalkbitcoin.com for episode-specific tip jars. If you'd like to sponsor the show, please contact Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com to start the conversation. I hope you're enjoying this diversion from our usual segmented format. As always, it's an experiment, and your feedback is appreciated. Let's get back to the conversation. 
I've been trying to think of what a good analogy is, and I started with, I have a file cabinet, right? Tons of personal information, tax returns in it, you know, and receipts and all sorts of stuff that I don't really need most of the time, but that occasionally I need to dig out because I need to send it somewhere or, you know, like mortgage stuff or verification or taxes or things like that. To a certain extent, what you're talking about here is like a smart filing cabinet that lives in the cloud where you can make keys for it, you know, make keys for this filing cabinet that you can give to different people that give them that have different, but they're like smart keys. It's, you know? it's, it's more it's like automated. It, yeah. It's like yeah. each individual piece of data, each individual file, if you want to call it that, uh -huh. is locked with a different key. Uh -huh. And you give so this is the granularity. specific key rings to specific people I to see. unlock specific things. So you might have three different bios. You might have the one that is for your LinkedIn right. or you know your professional network. You might have one for your, your family and best friends. And you might have one for the public at large or just new people in general. So each of those are locked with different private keys. And so you're going to be able to share those with different people. Again, I'm not a coder, so I don't know how this is actually being done, but I would say that these, these things aren't encrypted with symmetric cryptography because then the people that you give it to could just share the keys with anybody and then anybody else could come in and right. unlock the file. So instead, what I think a personal cloud is going to do is going to make a copy of the data, encrypt it with the other person's public key, and then send it to them hmm. so that they can then decrypt it with their private key when uh, they log into their their personal cloud. Okay, I see. So there never is any unencrypted data on the on the net. No. You're not releasing anything. It just gets encrypted under a different specific person or organization's key. Exactly. Unless, of course, you set it to public. Right. And then it's it's like Twitter. It's just all out in the open. Right. For certain things, like I use Twitter. I don't mind having a, a public-facing you know, website, my blog is public, my right. consulting website is public. So there are things that I don't care about sharing with the whole world. But then there are also things that I prefer to only keep between myself and selected individuals. Those are the kinds of things that personal clouds are going to be especially useful for. Because right now, when you send a direct message to somebody on Facebook, or when you text message somebody, if you're not using encrypted text messaging, then that's just clear text sitting in multiple other servers. The NSA server, your service provider servers, and every server in between. Your ISP, your cell phone company, all, all of these different servers. With a personal cloud, instead, it's just going to be all a bunch of cipher text. Right. sitting on all of these servers and you know good luck trying to decrypt all of it well you could try but you know Again, like good you luck said, trying all of it <laughs> yeah i mean they it, when everything is encrypted how do you know what to target right exactly exactly are you going to spend 10 years trying to brute force something only to find out it says i like pudding yeah. you know like or you know meet me at starbucks at three you know it's yeah. just it's going to seem it's going to make these these efforts for collecting data just look absolutely silly all of a sudden, they don't even know who to target anymore. You know, I, I read recently that right now, encrypting your data by default makes you a target. Right. They, they're much more likely to hang on to it and build a nice little profile on you. Right. <laughs> and spend some effort trying to decrypt your stuff, especially when most of your communications aren't encrypted, but then like selected conversations right. are. But when everything is encrypted by default, all of a sudden it becomes kind of like boss. What do you want me to do here? So, so we have to move the baseline, basically. Right now, it's it's abnormal if you encrypt because mm -hmm. few people do it because it's a hassle. And when you do do it, then it's because it's something that you actually need to encrypt. You feel like for the most part. I mean, I, mean, I for, for most for people, most people that's the that's for the most perception. People, I'd say that's the perception for sure. I mean, I have use text secure and, and red phone and gpg right. with all of my friends who were willing to download it and fa thankfully a lot of my friends have been willing to since i've learned about this stuff and it is kind of just like encrypt by default why because we can right and because the picture of somebody trying to brute force something and then seeing you know i like pudding at the end of it is just so hilarious yeah. <laughs> in our minds we're already beginning to see steps people are taking towards actually going through the learning curve of figuring out how to use these encryption tools and using them, specifically since these node end leaks came out. When it actually becomes something that people don't have to work to do, 
when it's just that's the default mode of behavior where it's going on behind the scenes and they don't even have to think about it, then that many more people will be doing it. I mean, I see personal clouds being like the next, not Facebook, but the next personal computer. It's, it's not just, just an evolution from social networks. It's an evolution as a platform from which you, you do all of your work. Because think about it. Google itself, okay, Google is kind of like a company I, I love to hate because I'm a Gmail user. I use Google Docs for various things. Nothing sensitive, obviously. When it's handy, I use it. It's kind of the default search engine. I've been using StartPage and DuckDuckGo more. In Mozilla, it's the default search engine, and they get the kind of the best results because they are the biggest monstrosity of a search engine. There's a lot of things I love about Google, but there's also a lot of things that I hate about Google, particularly their revenue-raising model where they take all of this stuff that I do with them and then sell it to someone else so that they can serve me ads. I mean, that's just... Would you pay for search? Would I pay for search? Would you pay for search I would pay. I would pay for a Google account huh. if it gave me access to all sense. of the things that they do. I mean, I pay for internet. Right. I pay for cell phone service. Why wouldn't I pay for personal cloud provider which is going to protect my data? And that's the value that these personal cloud providers are going to be selling to their customers. You're going to get all of the features of all of these other services that you use minus the part where they take all of your data and give it to the highest bidder or so, give it to whoever is pointing guns at them or whatever the case may be. So you, you said that this is not an evolution of technology broadly, but an evolution of the personal computer. And I'm, I'm very curious for the thought behind that because I, I don't really see the connection there. Uh, isn't a computer more about what it enables you to do in terms of hardware capabilities? What, what, are, what are you meaning by that? Cloud computing and cloud processes, cloud services in general, are advancing at such a quick pace where you'll be able to be delivered you know, software as a service or anything as a service, really, from a cloud provider. Like You'll be able to manipulate software that's stored on their machines. It doesn't matter what kind of machine you have, really. You could have something with like a Pentium 4 or something. So this is the Xbox and, One concept that they've been, they've been very interested in where... Yes, the hardware itself is not that impressive. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. The next release of the Xbox console that's uh, coming out... Yes, please explain. Yeah, is not that powerful overall, but what it does is it hooks up to the cloud, where in the cloud, supposedly, there are between two and three additional Xbox Ones worth of processing power available. So the, the thought is, is that even though your hardware isn't that impressive... This cloud is impressive, and so people can build games with the idea that it's not your hardware, but the hardware that you have, plus some buffer in the cloud, and that over time, rather than upgrading the hardware, they'll just upgrade the cloud, so you won't need to buy another box. But, but see, now Exactly. So, so your personal cloud platform is a shell. It's a shell within which you, you store minimal amounts of data. And I say minimal, meaning it's like your whole life. On a kilobytes processing level, it's really easily digestible by pretty much any machine that exists right now. My smartphone could handle the storage of this data. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And then it's these other servers of the service providers that, that you need for, for doing your financial transactions or doing your gaming or doing your marketplace activities or whatever. They're going to be kind of like the communities that you still kind of carry around your identity to all of these different places, but they're just getting the relevant info that they need out of your, out of your personal cloud. So they're not actually storing any of the data. It's all in your personal cloud, and they just kind of take what they need to, to do the minimum function that you're asking for. So in the case of a marketplace, it pulls your reputation information. It might pull your address if you need to have stuff sent to you. It might pull your email so that if there's even email. I mean, in, in reality, these things will be able to send messages to each other. So email itself might not even be necessary as a, as a service one day. So when you're talking about email and how these can send messages, but it's not email, how is it different from email? Is it more like a personal message? I mean, like, is this, is this a semantic differentiation? It's, it's still an address. It needs to know how to get this message from point A to point B. But the address isn't at gmail.com. It's your home address. Okay. Kind of. I gotcha. This is your place on the network. Right. And this is how it finds you. Huh. And that's what XDI, that's short for Extensible Data Interchange Protocol, is going to do. The whole personal cloud 
platform is built off of a semantic data graph. Okay, what does that mean? Basically, what it means is that all of your things are individual points on the graph, all individually addressable. And so that's how they find the other personal clouds find your stuff. So that no matter who your cloud service provider is, the actual address is it still can be found on the network. So is this like everybody has a unique name? And so through that unique name, so long as you know the name, you can find the person and interoperate and, you know, and connect with them and make one of these contracts with them. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Essentially. So, okay. the, like I said, it's, it's your it's your singular identity that you're able to take anywhere. Okay. So that no matter who your cloud service provider is, all of the links that you you've given out to other people to find your stuff are all still valid. That's the most important part. Is that you know if I delete my Facebook, all of a sudden, you can't see anything that I ever had on Facebook ever again. Whereas with personal clouds, as long as I have a personal cloud that's active on the line on the internet somewhere you can access it the the addresses don't change the links don't change so let's talk about finance for a second that was one of the other categories that you brought up in the last couple of years i've had my identity stolen twice without ever having lost my credit card so that implies to me that there's a minor security problem with transactions that happen on the internet would personal clouds have saved me from all of that headache? Is that, I mean, or, or are they just a replacement, but they can't really fix some of these problems? I would say it depends on what actually occurred. There's a possibility that you got a man in the middle. That's kind of a very sophisticated attack that is usually very targeted because they're targeting I, I'm pretty your boring, browser. and I was even more boring when I was doing this. Okay, I got to think it was it, something. Yeah, it had to have been something more like on the other server side. How I, would it work? Okay, so it depends on what you're actually doing and what the whole financial ecosystem looks like. Because, you know, if we're talking about Bitcoin exchanges, there's like no personal identity information to steal. Right. If you're talking about lines of credit, banking, so then let me ask like a better that. question. Then what I'm what I'm saying is, I want to go to Amazon.com and I want to place an order for something and buy it, and I don't want to store my credit card with them because I'd rather not have my credit card on file with them or pick someone less reputable than Amazon. Sure, sure. No, let's even go with the Amazon example because you know Amazon is a company that that stores people's credit cards and right. debit card information so that they can do like one click shopping and right. stuff like that. Instead of Amazon storing your credit card details, your credit card would be in your personal cloud and you have a link contract with Amazon, which says that when I'm signed in, you have access to this information and only when I'm signed in. They don't take that information and store it while you're signed in. They just have access to it. So when you click that one click shopping thing, order here. Just real quick, your credit card data is processed. Your address information is sent to the merchant. As soon as you log out, that link is closed. Hmm. They don't any longer have the credit card number or anything. In fact, they don't even need the number because they're not a credit card processing company. They have probably a third party that's doing that. They run the credit card. And then it's over. And then that's it's over. That's what they needed it that's, for. That's, that's, that's all you need it for. Exactly. So the now, credit why... cards themselves, you know, like the whole credit card network is clear text. I don't know if anyone knows that, but when you run your credit card, all of the information that's going back to the credit card companies, it's not encrypted. It's clear text. <laughs> that's what cryptocurrencies are competing with right now. So if you want to use that, by all means, just know what you're allowing yourself to get into. Right. You know, when you bring something like cryptocurrencies into the picture, then the risk of fraud becomes even less. Because the, the private keys could theoretically be stored in your personal cloud. And only when you are logged into your personal cloud can those private keys even be accessed. From there, you can you know, send money to people and stuff like that. But then you're not even giving up any information whatsoever. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. So there's no third party that you even need to think about trusting with your personal data. So that is exciting to me. The social networking stuff is really cool. You know, being able to have my healthcare information downloaded straight into my personal cloud, that's all really cool. But what I think is really powerful and really exciting is that this is going to enable a true peer-to-peer -peer marketplace to emerge where I don't even need Amazon. Amazon is just another walled garden. Instead, the merchants are going to post the things to their personal clouds, make them public, and then I search for those things in my personal cloud. And the personal cloud service does a dictionary discovery lookup through the whole 
a semantic data graph I was talking about earlier and finds all of the things that match my search query and serves them to me. And then I can narrow it down even further to say, you know, I don't just want a dresser. I want a black dresser. I want a black dresser with six drawers. And then the search continues and continues till it gets down to exactly what I want. I buy it right there from the merchant, me, peer to peer. Let's say that, you know, we get to this post Amazon world where Amazon is no longer required because you have these personal clouds, both you personally and let's say me as a vendor. What does that world look like? How do, how do we find each other? Are we negotiating? A... <laughs> yeah. Blue heron just flew by. It was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, are, are we literally negotiating, you know, like, do we have a contract where you, uh, you know, in advance so that you're able to look at my store or am I just putting it out there? How, how does that work? You know, most merchants on the internet, they have a public facing website. I mean, there are some private organizations where you need to have, have a membership to, to have access to, to their storefront. But for the most part on the internet and in the physical world, merchants doors are open to any customer who's willing to come in and take a look around. Uh, similarly, on the personal cloud network, merchants will just have all of their product postings be public. And, you know, I as a customer can do searches, as I described earlier, to find exactly what it is that I'm looking for. And then those merchants are competing with every other merchant who's offering what I'm looking for. So geography comes into play here for physical objects. So, I mean, like, is it, will it, so it'll be easy or automatic to filter if you're looking for something physical that, you know, you're only looking within a certain number of mile radius or, you know, a shipping cost radius. I mean, like, how would you define terms like that? Yeah, I think the search that you are conducting to find these things can be that granular. Just like Amazon, their sidebar shows, you know, categories and then price ranges and, and, and you know, things like that. You'll be able to categorize these things by the best price, closest location, and the personal cloud is going to be able to serve that information to you because, you know, it knows where you're at if you tell it where you're at. It knows where the merchant's at because the merchant has uploaded their location information and you know their shipping costs and the product costs are all going to be transparent. And so you know, you'll be able to organize your search results based on whatever criteria you're looking for. Maybe you don't care about price, maybe you care about high quality. So you look for the best rated item mm. or something like that. Whenever I'm using my uh, tablet, I'll have something come up and it'll say, such and such application would like to know your location. Is that the sort of thing also that could be stored in the personal cloud? Because I, I'm really tentative to give a lot of publishers that sort of information about me. I don't really want them to know where I am. That's not something that's important to me. But there are some things like map applications, for example, where you know it would be useful if, in fact, I did give it access to that. So sometimes you just say, okay, well, screw the privacy issues. I guess I might as well do this. Can personal clouds help in that situation too? Yes. If you do choose to give a third party your location, you know, your link contract will be governing exactly what they can do with that information. And if they break that contract, then it's just like breaking a legal contract where, you know, there, there are repercussions. Now, it's not a legal contract in the sense that you're not going to take them to court. These things will all be handled within the trust framework that the company has agreed with, essentially. And these things will be handled by uh, social pressures within the trust framework. If they abuse their privileges of getting certain access to your data, they might get locked out of the trust framework. And then no longer will people who agree to that trust framework ever do business with that entity ever again. So they have to maintain a good reputation. <clears throat> otherwise, it can potentially endanger their relationship with the entire network. Exactly. I see. Exactly. Because this is a peer-to-peer -peer environment, if I trust organization A, who also trusts organization B, who I have no relationship with right now, then by extension, I can trust organization B because we're all kind of agreeing to the same trust framework. If that trust framework is broken by organization B, then organization A has the power to cut off that relationship entirely. And then everyone else who would have had contact, some sort of connection with organization B, no longer does. They're now like a quote unquote stranger. They're not a friend of a friend, they're a stranger. And so they have to kind of start from the ground up to build up a good reputation or find another trust 
framework provider who is willing to extend them the benefits of access to their trust network. And these trust networks themselves will be federated so that the trust framework providers work with each other to kind of prevent bad actors from being able to just jump from one to another to another to another. Very quickly, it becomes a very accountable scenario where everybody in the network is accountable to basically everyone else. Why do you listen to Let's Talk Bitcoin? We'd really like to know. Are you a new user trying to learn the basics? Are you from the world of finance seeking clarity on investment opportunities? Are you an entrepreneur looking for opportunity in a world of confusion? Write and tell us your story. Adam at Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. Like the fortune teller says, may you live in strange times, and we certainly do. Do you have a project or passion that falls into what I loosely define as technology or philosophy that can change everything? We want to hear from you. Adam at Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. In theory, it seems like the primary weakness of this is that if someone ever gets your keys, gets your ability to access your personal cloud, then it's just as bad as if someone gets your Bitcoin keys, you know, gets your Bitcoin private keys. And basically they can do anything that you can do, which in this case, you know, just as you have full control, so does anyone who compromises your personal cloud. Is that a concern? That is a concern for sure. That's a concern in any sort of environment where you need to authenticate yourself. And, you know, authentication is provided remotely where, you know, it's not like you, the physical ego individual right. walking up to a window and saying, hi, I want access to this stuff. But instead, it's like this abstract version of you going over Internet lines to then authenticate with some cryptic string of you know letters and numbers and symbols. Right. At the start, I'm sure that the authentication will just be like two-factor by default, almost assuredly. From there, authentication technology itself is getting really interesting with biometrics. I've seen brainwave authentication. I mean, we could end up with something where we're looking through a heads-up display. Mm. Not like Google Glass. Google Glass is very primitive. But something even more advanced where we have a full field of vision where we're just seeing the the graphical user interface in our field of vision and it has a little node that's that's like pressing against our temple and then we authenticate by thinking of a certain thing while blinking three times or something like that Hmm. you know i mean it's the way the technology is going i think that the market will definitely find a way to make authenticating into your personal cloud very difficult for somebody to break, but very easy for you yourself to get into. Right. Much like right now, let's take this this whole thing offline, pre-internet days. All of this same information exists, your financial data, your health data, you know, your relationships and all of that. All of that still exists, but in analog form. A lot of this stuff is stored in vaults. Can vaults be broken? Yeah, they can be broken. Someone could install a a hidden camera and watch you put in the combination or or somebody could just rubber hose cryptography style, you know, just beat it out of you. Any number of different kinds of attacks could be launched to compromise your personal data, even when it's stored in analog fashion. It's just the difference of accessibility, really, because in the difference here almost entirely is just that In the case of analog data, someone actually has to be there at the vault to do it. And from the, you know, from the cloud side of data, they just have to be on the Internet. They just have to be connected. And so that's, I guess, the thing is that there's a much larger pool of people who potentially can go after your information. But I think that you're right. That's not something that's really restricted to personal clouds. That's just and again, it's about centralization to a certain extent. It's because you've got all this information there that makes it more valuable than it is spread out all over everywhere. That is correct. And that's why the barrier to getting that information should be that much greater to scale. 
for somebody who doesn't know the the private keys, you know, like the personal cloud providers would perhaps require that your password have one cap, one caps lock, one special character and one number or something like that. Yeah, And be like 11 characters and be long. like 11 yeah. characters long. Right. And, you know, say this isn't just Facebook. This is like your life. This is the only password you're ever going to need to remember ever again. But it better be damn good. Instead of just being 12 characters, it should be a line from your favorite movie that you'll never forget or something like that. But not that. that because that's human readable. And so if it's human readable, then it's brute forceable. But I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And then, you know, when you add in something like what I was talking about earlier, where it's like brainwave authentication, then you don't even need to right. remember it's, a password. It's, it's just, just you. It's literally it's just, you. It's just, yeah, it's literally just you. And nobody could possibly replicate that unless, again, they just, they found you, held a gun to your head and said, authenticate and right. send me all your everything, you know, and people can do that now with analog data. So it's like. Make them an offer they can't refuse, so to speak. Exactly. And so I don't see some kind of new threat models emerge, but when it comes down to it, I don't think it's a showstopper. I don't think it's going to get in the way right, of this right. technology becoming that next evolution from the personal computer to the personal cloud that, that I foresee it being. So we started this conversation talking about trust, talking about how in a system where you're meeting new people and you want to do business, it's really difficult to do anything when there's no trust in the system. And so we have systems like Bitcoin that come around, look at this problem and they say, okay, the solution is to simply remove all the trust from the system, to not trust anybody and to make it entirely about what is real and what is now. So with Bitcoin, the analog here is, is ownership. You know, is if you have a Bitcoin, it's not like I owe you a Bitcoin and so then you have to rely on me to give that to you. If you have it, then you have it. If you don't, then you don't. It's very straightforward, either on or off, no middle ground. And I would actually even amend that to say it's not ownership, it's control. Hmm. You don't own your Bitcoins. Okay. Don't pretend you do. Okay. You, you only control the private keys and that control could easily be lost. But isn't the control system, ownership? I mean, what, what it, it defines just, ownership? It's, it's semantics. Okay. Really. It's semantics more than anything. Control is ability to manipulate whatever it is that, that we're talking about. Okay. Sure. Um, I'll buy that. And I would even go so far as to say the exclusive ability at that moment in mm -hmm. time. Multiple parties can be wrestling for control of certain things. And with Bitcoin, as you said, it's very binary. You either do or you don't. Right. You know, when your private keys are compromised, the Bitcoins are leaving your account immediately and you can, you'll can you never see them again unless you can find where the wallet they move to right. and then get those private keys. Right. And, you know, so, but yeah, it's a just, it was a semantic. versus spy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was just a semantic thing I wanted to throw out there just for the listener you. to maybe ponder a little bit. Well, I think that that's a, it's a well-made point, you know, but trust is hard. Trust, you know, is another analog to it beyond control is faith because... It means that I have faith in you, if we're trusting one another, that you will follow through on what you're saying. When you have nothing that actually mandates that you do it. The solution that, that you advocate is reputation. And reputation that isn't necessarily tied to your social security number or tied to exactly who you are, you know, in real life, but just that's tied to past actions. And I think it's a really interesting idea to differentiate between trust that is built on identity versus trust that is built on action. And, and I wanted to know what you thought about that. Well, we have to connect those two things because how do you know that the past actions over here were undertaken by the same person that's over here that you're, you're trying to trust? And so there are identities involved. It's just not necessarily identities as we think of them today. Well, where you said identities. It's... Identities, I think that's kind of what I'm getting at here is that, you know, again, we get back to this idea that it's about action rather than identity. Action can lead to identity. If you are somebody who does something, you know, and, and that's the thing that you do, you build an identity around those actions. It's not that the identity necessarily has to come first. It's just, you're right, they do get tied together. This is, this is true, and that's a good point that you make right there, is that in reality, identity isn't just a piece of paper that says a name and a social security number and an address. It is who you are and what you do. No matter how many different pseudonyms we have on the internet, we are a single ego consciousness undertaking actions in many different venues in real life and on the internet. 
personal clouds, the way that they're going to enable this full granular control of identity, it's going to allow for people to build a reputation around a singular, what I'll call a cryptographic identity. Because ultimately, that's what this whole this whole thing is built off of is cryptographic authentication. So you'll be able to have a reputation rating that's built around this this cryptographic identity, and then the face of that identity can vary depending on what context you are entering into. So again, what your coworkers see might be different from what your family sees, from what your best friend sees. Your reputation score, which is associated with your personal cloud. Is the same, no matter which which of these which of these things you're facing. You might not show your reputation score to everybody, but you're not going to really be able to change it. Depending on the reputation provider, of course, if you controlled it, then you could manipulate the numbers, say whatever you wanted.、Uh, the reputation ratings. Instead, we get back to that verifiable thing. So we get back to the verifiable thing, where the whole personal cloud network is built off of. This trust framework, basically, you. When you say trust framework, I think that another way to put that would be it's built on a set of rules, right? Rules yeah, it's by which、rules. people are judged, by which actions are judged, you know, and and because if you're generating a score, you have to be judging things. You have to be saying this is something that gives you more points versus this is something that does not give you more points. The, with the basic trust framework in place, where you contract with a personal cloud service provider, they describe to you exactly. Uh, what they're going to do with your data, and if they ever break that contract, then everybody else who's a party to that contract, being you know all of their other members, all of their business partners, all of these people are going to see that reneging of the contract and respond to it, whether it's with ostracism or demanding that you be compensated, any number of different steps that can be taken to. You know, pressure this organization into to make the situation right. If they refuse, then comes the ostracism, where they're just booted out of the network, and they have to create this reputation from scratch, or try to find somebody else who will trust them into a new network.、Right. But if they know that they they have a reputation for deleting all of your data, or you know, not backing it up, and being you know, a bad actor, being a bad actor. If they have a reputation for being a bad actor, then they're either going to get trusted into a network and put on a very tight leash, or they're just not going to be accepted at all. And so, very quickly, bad actors are kind of weeded out of the system. And it's important here. To note that this is possible because there's a lot of competition in the space. That's the idea: is that all of this is essentially an open, interoperable platform, and so it's not like Facebook, where Facebook does something wrong, and you're like, "Oh well, I'd like to quit Facebook, but where would I go?" You know,、exactly. all of my data is there. Exactly. So the competition part is very important because without competition, then monopolies and cartels can easily form. Because this is an open, peer-to-peer platform, why would I do business with a bad actor when I have All of these really good candidates over here that I can deal with.、Right. People are going to have to watch their behavior. They really are going to have to work hard to build trust and then keep it. Yeah, the keep it part is really an interesting point because, like you said, you know, again, going back to Facebook, I don't mean to harp on them so much. Facebook didn't start off with this model where they were sell your customers' data, monetize everything possible because you can't figure out how to make money from any other way. But it is that once you've got the network effect there, then there's all of this built-in incentive to stay, including your data, also that everybody else is there, because all of these cloud providers are going to be interoperable, and it won't matter. You know, you can I can talk to you on G Plus while I'm on Facebook in this sort of situation. Then again, the network effect is no longer applied on a company by company basis or a provider by provider basis, and instead is almost just the entire the cloud. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The 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 idea. Of personal clouds or enterprise clouds is the thing that has the potential to get viral, rather than any particular provider in the space. Exactly, and that's what's important to note about personal clouds is that kind of like Skype or like Bitcoin, it's a viral technology where you need other people to be participants in the network for it to be tangibly valuable to you. Like a language. Like a language. The concept might be like. A million dollar idea in your head,、right. but if no one else is using it, then it's not a million dollar idea.、It's、just like Bitcoin, early adopters of Bitcoin saw something that was really awesome 
that has a lot of potential. Nobody's using it. <laughs> so I'm going to send 10,000 Bitcoins to get a couple pizzas. Right. Nowadays, we look at that like crazy. You're, you're insane. Right. That's because the network is that much more valuable and therefore Bitcoin itself is that much more valuable. And so similarly, early adopters of personal clouds, it will be a tight knit community. We're all just kind of like talking to each other and talking about how great personal clouds are going to be one day, trying to onboard as many of our friends and family as possible. It's not going to be anywhere near as much friction as trying to get people to start using Bitcoin, because as soon as your friends are using it, it's valuable. You know, I don't do business with my friends. Using Bitcoin with my friends doesn't really, it's like a novelty. It's like, hey, I can pay you back for lunch you got me the other day, right. you know, stuff <laughs> like that. But like for the most part, I'm doing business with, for the most part, strangers, you know, just people I trust because they have a good reputation on the internet. Right. Which goes back to the reputation part. But, you know, with, with personal clouds, they're immediately valuable once you start having like a tight knit. If just my friends and family are using it, it's valuable to me. Still valuable, even at that low level, low local level. In fact, that is one of the reasons why it's most valuable. That's who I'm having sensitive conversations with that I don't want Facebook's or Google's employees reading in right. on. Let's play a dangerous game here. Tell me the future on this. How far out are we from a normal person being able to go and sign up with a personal cloud provider and get into this system? I did an interview with Drummond Reed, who was the co-founder of the Respect Network that I referenced earlier. Um, Respect Network is a network of cloud service providers who are all agreeing to that Respect Trust framework, which governs how data will be used. Drummond said that beta testing will begin in the fall of this year. Okay. And that's beta testing. I am a member of developer alpha testing a personal cloud platform which was designed I believe by Newstar in collaboration with Project Danube they were signing people up at the Internet Identity Workshop which I attended earlier this year you know I signed up right there on the spot and I played around with it a little bit it's pretty cool so not too far out um, but yeah really not too far out this isn't like singularity where we have to wait for you know 20 years right. to see if it happens this is something that's going to be available to people on a commercial level by next year at the absolute latest so John light for people who want to get in touch with you or get involved with any of your projects how, how can they find you they can reach me on Twitter at Litecoin, L-I-G-H-T-C-O-I-N, or through my blog, www.p2pconnects.us. Thanks for joining us on Let's Talk Bitcoin today. Thanks for having me on, Adam. You've been listening to episode 21 of Let's Talk Bitcoin. If you liked, loved, or hated the show, we want to know what you think. Please email all feedback to adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Thanks to John Light for being the exclusive content provider for this episode. Music for this episode is provided by Jared Rubens and Lucas AMKC. Stay tuned for episode 22 of Let's Talk Bitcoin, releasing Tuesday, July 9th. Thanks for listening.